Welcome to the fifth episode of International Marxist Television, brought to you by Socialist Appeal at Socialist.net. My name is Joe Attard, I'm a Socialist Appeal activist, and I'm also a member of the University and Colleges Union, UCU, at King's College London. And we come to you at the end of a very exciting and interesting academic year, which has seen the biggest and most militant strike action by university workers, and particularly lecturers, in living memory. Um, it involved thousands of university workers, um, both academic and support staff, and it also saw a huge wave of grassroots solidarity action by students and a number of occupations up and down the country in solidarity with the striking lecturers. And here to discuss these events, we have Ben Gledeski, who's the national organiser of the Marxist Student Federation, and Fiona Lally who is the president of the SOAS Marxist Society and had the very good fortune to be a delegate to the National Union of Students Conference. So, Fiona, how did the strikes affect students and how did the issue of uh, the pension cuts and marketization, casualization and so on more generally affect students? Yeah. Well, the marketization of education is what has directly caused um, the enormous tuition fees that students have today. Um, and on top of that, um, increasing very much kind of scandalous rent um, prices, um, particularly in London, but also across the country. Um, and grants have been cut and, you know, linked with the wider austerity that we're living under. Um, the government has constantly attacked workers and students and the youth. Um, and that's and particularly in universities and higher education, we've moved towards a much more business-like model in which students are consumers and universities um, are kind of competing for those consumers. Um, and this uh, model, this business-like model, means that universities are conscious of money and what they need to do in order to make savings and they think about their budget more than they think about what's necessary for students and what's necessary to create a nurturing uh, learning environment for those students. Um, and so in order to make uh, savings, universities uh, have to exploit their workers and they have to attack their workers, which, um, like you're just talking about, resulted in the pensions scheme that just happened. Um, and students can recognise and they could feel immediately, I think, during that strike that it was, you know, not just about the lecturers, but it's about the students as well. And it's about the whole university and who makes it up. It's not just the lecturers, but it's also the students uh, as well as that, and that's why um, we did see students coming out on, on the picket lines with the, their lecturers during that strike. Mm, and that was very much a message conveyed from the grassroots of the UCU, at the very least. This isn't just about our pensions, this is about your education, about the sector more generally as well. Uh, ben, the Marxist Student Federation was of course involved in solidarity efforts around the UCU strike. In your opinion, how well uh, did students support the lecturers in their industrial action? Oh yeah, well, I mean, there was massive support. YouGov did a poll just before the strike started, uh, which said that in the institutions where, uh, where where staff were going on strike, students supported the strike with about, about two, two out of three students supported the strike. It was about 66% in those institutions. And uh, only the same poll found that only 2% of students um, blamed the staff for the disruption being caused to the teaching. So it gives you an idea of, of which side the students were on. And you saw it as well, you saw it on the picket lines, that's the point. Uh, in Glasgow, in Liverpool, I've never seen such big picket lines on any strike, to be honest, let alone a strike at university, and it's because the students were there filling it out. And in the student unions as well, you saw that kind of support. In Queen Mary, about 180 people turned up to the, to the, to the open meeting. Uh, of the student union to pass a resolution uh, in support of the strike action. I in Canterbury, there were loads of students on the picket line. It took the student union about two weeks before they came out to say anything at all about the strike. Eventually, they did come out in support of it, but so lukewarm was their support that when they were addressing a rally of students, the student union president got heckled and booed for not being more supportive of the strike. And bear in mind as well, all of this was taking place in that snowy patch that we had around that time of year, right? There was, there was a demonstration in London. Uh, in, in, well, while the snow was, was falling thick and fast, there were, there were people, there were students, hundreds of students on the picket line up and down the country in sub-zero temperatures. It gives you an idea of, of how much support there actually was. And actually, I think the support 
it took everyone by surprise, especially the, uh, the UCU leaders. I don't think they were expecting that level of student support. It was really impressive. No, absolutely. And it's interesting that you mentioned the UCU leaders and the relative tepidity of the leaders of the student movements, because I felt like in the strike there was a real split in terms of energy and radicalism between the leadership and the membership, between the leaders and the grassroots. Um, in fact, from the perspective of the UCU, our leaders were a break on our action from the beginning and they remained a dead weight around our necks for the entire duration of the strike. And in fact, there was a point about three weeks into the strike where it was going from strength to strength and it was at its most radical where they almost stitched us up. Um, Sally Hunt, who is the general secretary of the UCU, went behind the back of the membership, behind the back of delegates, um, and attempted to uh, stitch up an absolutely rotten deal with the bosses that probably most gallingly of all, aside from the fact that the terms were um, terrible, would have required us to cover any hours lost to the strike uh, for free in turn three in order to make up for the inconvenience of our strike action. And I've got to say, I, I've been in academia for not as long as, as some, but I think you'd be hard pressed to think of a time in the history of the higher education sector in Britain where lecturers got together on a grassroots basis overnight organizing on social media there was a hashtag going around on Twitter no capitulation in response to this attempted stitch up and organized a spontaneous grassroots protest at the UCU head office in London and at one point nearly stormed the building so Fiona we talked about the limitations of the UCU's leadership um, what did the official leadership of the student movement do, or as the case may be, not do with regards to supporting the UCU strike? Yeah. So um, this year I was a delegate to the NUS conference um, and I was quite excited because the conference um, was taking place uh, during the, the UCU strike and like you said earlier, um, this UCU strike is the most militant um, strike that we've seen in the education field for a very long time. Um, and so I was excited to go to the NUS because the NUS as an institution has seven million students behind it and therefore I would say has the infrastructure and the capacity um, to mobilise those students and make a real difference and be a real um, uh, force, a real energy um, in the UCU strike. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, the leadership was incredibly weak. The leadership of the NUS is incredibly weak. Um, and not only did they take a very long time when the strike first happened to even come out in support of the strike and give out information, but the NUS conference, which could have been almost a war cry, it could have been a really energetic, uh, start to you know mobilizing all students out on the picket lines and supporting their lecturers um, it was very weak and it was you know over the course of the com conference it was very rarely mentioned um, and that's because the, the leadership of the NUS have no real desire to be that force they have no real desire to link up students with the working class and with their lecturers and with workers in wider society um, and if they had done that then we would have been in a incredible position, um, not just uh, in you know defending uh, education and stopping these attacks on the education sector, but also um, the attacks that austerity is causing throughout the whole of society. You know, if the NUS leadership um, had mobilized the students in the way it could have done, um, we could have seen a huge uh, change in society in terms of linking up students and um, education lecturers and workers with other workers, other trade unions mm -hmm. throughout society that are all being attacked um, and we could have potentially brought down this government uh, but the NUS leadership was incredibly weak um, and didn't really do anything I would say and over the course of the conference um, it wasn't really discussed it was uh, there were a couple of motions I think put forward in order to get the strike discussed in order to really build genuine solidarity with the strike um, but they weren't they weren't discussed over the course of the conference um, due to a combination of things, but in particular an occupation that took place um, that uh, resulted in countless motions uh, being pushed off the agenda. Um, and I think that's a real shame because uh, there was a real gen there was a real opportunity there for the 
NUS, you know, with its role in the student movement, with its authority in the student movement, um, to have really made a, a big difference, but it didn't do that, and I think we missed a massive opportunity. I remember at the time, um, it was said online, oh, the NUS has reached peak NUS, they've mm -hmm. occupied their own conference. Yeah. Um, do you think that has an effect in terms of putting off the wider layers of students who might otherwise be involved? Definitely, I think so. I think in general a lot of students don't know the NUS exists mm -hmm. because I think if you go on the official NUS website they even say that their role is to help students with campaigning and get cheap student deals and this kind of stuff. You know, it's very apolitical, it's very neutral, um, which ignores one, what a union is, and two, um, what it could be and who it's representing and it should be leading the fight against, the fight for free education sorry, um, but it's not and I think that what happened at that conference um, with the occupation and just, you know, met, there are probably countless other examples of things that happen at NUS, is it was a very inward looking um, event mm. and I think a lot of students in wider society um, will feel alienated from the NUS as a result of that and, you know, won't feel like it's a body that is actually fighting in their interests uh, for free education, for example. Um, yeah. Okay, well, it sounds like it was a pretty sorry affair, but were there any significant discussions or decisions made at the NUS conference at all? I mean, as far as the UCU strike is concerned, there were no um, significant decisions made or motions passed, and I think that's just a missed opportunity, mm. really. That's quite disappointing. <laughs> so, Ben, uh, we mentioned briefly that the strike also saw a wave of student occupations in solidarity with the lecturers. Um, what were those like? There were members of the MSF in some of those occupations, of course. So. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I mean, well, the occupations uh, and student occupations uh, included in that can be a very powerful tool in the class struggle. Uh, and certainly the people involved with all these occupations had the, the best interests of, of the movement at heart. Um, <clears throat> In general, though, I'd say these, this wave of occupations was a little bit disappointing. Um, <clears throat> as a general rule, most of them seem to be formed um, or seem to be initiated by, by small cliques of, uh, of activists, you know, not based on a political program, a set of ideas that unites them, based instead on effectively people they knew. It was a friendship group uh, in some cases. And the result was there was no kind of mass participation, certainly not at first, in any of these occupations. And in fact, the result of that in, for example, Southampton and Liverpool was occupations that lasted a couple of hours before they were chucked out by security. Because when you've got a small number of people, it's very easy for security to isolate that kind of occupation and shut it down. So the, the way these occupations were initiated were, were not the best, in my opinion. Um, and then, uh, I mean, the other problem they had, where they did manage to last more than a couple of hours, they didn't really make a, a very good job of turning outwards and involving as many students as possible in the occupations. Because that's really how occupations can be effective. It's when they turn outwards and, get, and loads of people get stuck into them. It's not what happened in these cases. For example, in, uh, in, in Liverpool, in Reading, uh, a number of other places. The occupiers aimed for small administrative buildings, corridors in some cases, basically spaces that were not open to loads of students getting involved. What you need in occupation is as many people involved as possible. If you have it in a tiny little administrative room at the top of a tower that no students even know where it is, or a corridor where you can fit about 20 students, you're not going to have a good occupation because you can't get people involved. And likewise, once you're in the occupation, you've got to have good, interesting, discussions that link the occupation to the broader question, in this case the UCU strikes, link it to that industrial struggle. Uh, but what happened in, in Reading, in Edinburgh, in Cambridge, uh, you had discussions that instead uh, were on topics like drag culture or, or lesbianism in 20th century Britain or divestment from fossil fuels, things that whilst maybe interesting uh, perhaps uh, for, for some people, they're not what is going to engage the mass of students with uh, the strike at hand basically, which is what those occupations should have been used for. They should have been used to get people involved, 
uh, discussing the strike, how to build solidarity uh, and everything else. And so whilst there was loads of student support for the strike, as, as I've already mentioned, as those opinion polls indicate and as the presence on the picket lines indicated, the occupations remained very small in number, they didn't manage to turn outwards, and to be honest in a lot of cases felt a bit like activism for its own sake. And that was a, a wasted opportunity uh, also, just as Fiona was talking about with the NUS, well, uh, well this, these occupations were also a wasted opportunity unfortunately. So yeah, I think that that statement, um, a missed opportunity, really summarises the outcome of what was really a very impressive action um, at its height, and that was epitomised at our recent UCU Congress, which if anything was even more absurd than the NUS conference that Fiona endured. Um, Prior to that, a deal had been accepted, which effectively ended the strike. Um, the bosses, uh, the union tops rather, used uh, scaremongering to push that deal through, despite the fact that it has no real assurances as far as resolving the um, issue with the pension scheme goes. It just kicked the can down the road for a year. And at Congress, there were two motions to be discussed, a motion of no confidence in Sally Hunt, General Secretary, and a motion of censure for her and her clique's behaviour during the strike. And um, this actually culminated in Sally Hunt and some of the paid representatives of the UCU who have represented in that capacity by another union, Unite, calling uh, industrial action against their own members. And I must say, this is the first instance I have ever seen or heard of of unionists relying on representation from another union to call an industrial action against their own members. And the reason they did that was to avoid having to be held accountable democratically by delegates. At one point, they walked out repeatedly um, when these motions came up. No fewer than four times delegates tried to discuss these motions. And in the end, when they had nowhere left to run and they were going to have to face the music, they switched all the microphones off and walked out and turned off or the PA system turned off the cameras so that Congress couldn't continue and it was curtailed. It was absolutely absurd and it really demonstrates the incredible limitations of the leadership of the union movements and indeed, as you both described, the leadership of the student movement as well. So I think it's fair to say that there were mistakes made but also there were lessons to be learned from the UCU strike. So this is a question to both of you. What should student activists in particular on campuses be doing um, in order to support workers' strikes and struggles and fight against broader issues of marketization, casualization, to fight for free education and that sort of thing? What kinds of actions should students be taking? Well, I mean, the, the crucial point, it comes back to actually um, one of the first questions you asked uh, that, that Fiona gave the answer to, is this point about linking all the struggles together. Right, like the, the, the problems that we face uh, as, as students and as workers all come from the same sort of source. Uh, this problem of marketization, of privatization, and so on. You can link these things together. And so it's really important, as Marxist students did, for example, uh, in the UCU dispute, to, to interview the workers and get their opinion and their struggle and their, their thoughts, their, their experience of, of everyday life. Um, into the minds of the students. So uh, we interviewed people, for example, on the picket line, and we wrote them up, we videoed people uh, all over the place, in Warwick, in, uh, in, in Kings, for example. Um, the, we, we put up loads of interviews um, uh, with, the, with the striking workers. And, uh, and then it's also really important to, to get the workers in person, get the striking staff in person to come and talk to the students about what's going on. So Marxist societies all over the country put on meetings, invited representatives, representative of the UCU uh, to discuss the strike and why students should be out on strike uh, as well. And, uh, and as much of that sort of thing as possible is really important. On the picket lines themselves and at the rallies, Marxist students were standing up and giving speeches explaining why the struggle of the workers and the struggle of the students is the same thing. It's that kind of uh, argument that is, that is required that students need to be making about linking the struggles of, of students and workers. And um, <clears throat> 
I mean, there's, there's practical things that need to be done as well, right? You need to, you need to involve as many people as possible and broaden out the struggle, as vo involve as many people as possible in things like the UCU dispute. So in Cambridge, for example, the Marxist Society put a motion to the student union saying that the student union should be the ones coordinating an occupation and involving as many students in it as possible, turning it outwards and using it to bolster the struggle of the, of the staff. Unfortunately, the, the actual, well, the occupation that did take place by, by a, a relatively small group of people um, cut across that so the, the student union didn't manage to get a chance to, to discuss that particular motion. But that kind of idea is what's required. The, um, a motion came from King's College, from the Marxist Society, uh, to, the, to the NUS conference, saying that the NUS needs to take a similar approach, linking up the struggles, that sort of thing. Marxist students were arguing, for example, for, for Unison members and, and for the Unison leadership to call its members out on strike in solidarity with the UCU struggle. We were making the argument that the Labour leaders, that Corbyn and McDonnell, need to be uh, linking this struggle up with other struggles in the public sector, trying to, trying to move towards, for example, a public sector general strike to bring down the government. That kind of thing, broadening the struggle out, this is the argument that Marxist students were making throughout the dispute, and that, in general, linking those struggles together is the crucial point. And above all, it has to have a political foundation, right? It has to be founded on the understanding that all of these struggles come from the same source. This isn't happening. This, isn't, this wasn't just a struggle about pensions. This isn't happening just because the Tories or the university bosses are particularly nasty people. There's a fundamental problem in society that means this kind of stuff is inevitable. As long as we have a system based on profit, as long as we have a capitalist system, we are going to come up against these problems. That's what unites all the struggles together. Having that political foundation, understanding Understanding that is, uh, is, is, is probably the most crucial thing that, that students can do uh, at the moment. That's the purpose of, of the Marxist Student Federation, that's why we exist, to have those kind of discussions, to have that understanding and use that understanding to, to guide our practice. I think ultimately it boils down to a question of leadership, as is so often the case when it comes to uh, worker struggle. So Fiona, um, do you have any final thoughts? Yeah, I think I would just, uh, I would encourage students um, to link their activism with theory, like Ben said, so that it has that political foundation. Um, because the Marxist Student Federation this year, we, you know, we had a conference celebrating 50 years since 1968, which was an incredibly revolutionary year that saw huge movements across the world, um, in Pakistan, in Mexico, in Czechoslovakia, in the USA, um, and in Paris. Um, I think that there's, in general, a fear, or I think some people feel like students are limited in their power, um, as we're not exactly workers in, in a traditional sense. But the lessons from 1968 show that students linked with workers can have huge power um, and uh, can make real difference. And in France, for example, in 1968, you know, with that mass movement that started with the students, the students um, very much sparked that. Um, and then, you know, linked up with the workers. On the basis of that, the French ruling class were terrified. And Charles de Gaulle um, famously said to the US ambassador that in a matter of days, the communists will have taken over. And that was because of um, the revolutionary mood or and movement that, you know, erupted in France at that time. And that is what students should look to for inspiration today, so they can recognise the power they do hold in society once they've linked up with the workers and their struggle. Um, and that is how, as students, we can help to change the world and that's why I would encourage students to link up with their Marxist societies on campus so that they're you know trained in theory and they're educated so they know that when these movements start to happen they're ready and we can really make a big difference. Okay well I think that's a really inspiring note to end on. Join us next time we'll be talking about women's struggles for abortion rights and against domestic violence and various other issues. In the meantime you can follow socialist.net for our latest articles, you can follow us on YouTube for videos and on SoundCloud for our podcast. See you next time.